What's up designers and welcome back to Rempton Games. Today I'm super excited to take a look at the designs of Pokemon from Generation 2 and see how they've changed since Generation 1. This is the second part in my Evolution of Pokemon design series, so if you haven't seen the first part yet, you should probably check that out first. I'll put the link in the description down below. For this episode, we're going to be taking a look at several different things that influence the designs of Generation 2 Pokemon. First, we're going to take a look at some general design trends that have to do with the themes of these games. Second, we're going to take a look at how new technology and mechanics have influenced these designs. Third, I want to take a closer look at the designs of legendary Pokemon, and we'll finish out with a comparison of Pokemon that serves similar roles in Generations 1 and 2. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start by looking at some of the general themes and trends of Generation 2. Generation 2 is kind of unique among Pokemon games in that it's designed as a direct sequel to the previous generation. Gen 1 and Gen 2 are very closely linked, and this can clearly be seen by looking at the games themselves. Gen 2 takes place three years after Red and Green, which matches the amount of time that has passed in the real world between the releases of these two games. In Gold and Silver, you can see many characters from the original games that have grown and changed over the intervening years. In addition, Gold and Silver are the only games other than remakes that allow the player to explore multiple regions in a single game. In this case, you can explore the new region Johto, but you can also go back to the Kanto region that you explored in Red and Green. This close relationship between the two generations actually extends even further to their early development. Gold and Silver were originally developed under the name Pokemon 2, and as can be seen from a 1997 demo which was shown at Nintendo's Space World convention, they were originally developed in a modified version of the Red and Green engine. Based on this evidence, it seems pretty clear that Gold and Silver were under development while Gen 1 was still going on. They probably began after Red and Green were released in Japan, but before the release of Pokemon Blue and Yellow, which were Gen 1's enhanced versions. The close relationship between these two generations also extends to the Pokemon themselves. For example, many Generation 2 Pokemon are direct evolutionary relatives of Pokemon from Generation 1. For example, you can look at Slowking and Blossom. Many original Pokemon also likely have their roots in Generation 1. One example that we know for sure is Gaoon, a Pokemon that was cut from Generation 1, but later got added to Generation 2 as Tyranitar. Despite these close ties, however, there are a number of things that make Generation 2 Pokemon distinct from their predecessors. One of the biggest and most pervasive was a narrowing and refining of the definition of what a Pokemon could be. In Generation 1, Pokemon came from a wide range of sources and could basically be anything. They could have multiple heads or bodies, they could be based off of inanimate objects or concepts, or be very humanoid. In Generation 2, this is no longer the case. In Generation 2, pretty much all of the newly introduced Pokemon families have very clear animal, plant, or mythological inspirations. Mareep is a sheep, Sudowoodo is a petrified tree, and so on. While there are a few odd outliers, like Unknown and Wobbuffet, that have more unusual inspirations for their designs, for the most part, this generation has chosen to have very natural inspirations for its Pokémon. I think there are a few reasons for this. The first one is a cultural reason. When Generation 1 was released, nobody had any preconceived notions about what a Pokémon was supposed to be. By the time Generation 2 rolls around, Pokemon had been around for a couple of years, and the word Pokemon had gathered some specific connotations. While Pokemon were originally just designed as monsters, due to the way that they were portrayed in media such as the very popular anime series, people began to think of them more as animals, with the ecosystem, predator-prey relationships, things like that. While there were certainly some of this in Gen 1, I think the design philosophy shifted towards Pokemon that would seem to make sense in a more natural environment. Another reason for this, however, is due to the themes of the Johto region. In the first games, players explore the Kanto region, which is based on a region of Japan with the same name. The Kanto region is the most industrialized and urbanized region of Japan, and is home to the Tokyo metropolitan area. 
Similarly, the Kanto region in Pokemon Red and Green show a modern, technologically advanced Pokemon world. Perhaps because of this, many of the original 151 Pokemon have urban influences in their designs. Coughing and Muck, for example, are based on urban pollution, whereas Pokemon like Porygon and Mewtwo show the influence of advanced technology. In contrast to this, the Johto region, which is the new region introduced in these games, is based on the Kansai region of Japan, which is more known for being a center of history and culture, which fits the themes of the Johto region. The Johto region is much more rural than the highly urbanized Kanto and is much more influenced by traditional Japanese culture. This can be seen by looking at things such as the Brass Tower or the Elix Forest Shrine. Because of this rural Japanese influence, many of the Pokémon seem to take inspiration from animals and plants that would make sense in a temperate forest environment. Pokémon like Stantler, Noctowl, Heracross, Ledibaw, and Pineco all fit this description. In addition to this trend away from some of the more unusual designs of Generation 1, Generation 2 has a general trend towards Pokémon that look more designed, for lack of a better word. While Pokémon in Generation 1 have a rough, jagged look to them, the designs of Generation 2 look somewhat more deliberate. I think the best way to show this is by comparison, and I think a good comparison for this would be Electabuzz with Ampharos. Both are electric-type Pokémon with primarily yellow bodies and black accents. While the black stripes on Electabuzz's body were definitely a design decision, the way they're drawn, they're meant to look like a natural part of Electabuzz's fur. Compare this to Ampharos's rings, which seem to be much more deliberately placed. As a matter of fact, rings and loops seem to be a common design motif among Generation 2 Pokémon, and can be seen on Pokémon such as Furret, Umbreon, and Ursaring. Another way to see this would be to look at the birds that appear early on in these different games. In Generation 1, you have the Pidgey line, which seem to be based on relatively basic, somewhat realistic-looking birds. Compare this to Hoot Hoot and Noctowl, which fill a very similar role in Generation 2, and you can immediately see the differences. The newer designs seem much less natural, especially with the clock-like design on Hoot Hoot's face, and they overall have a smoother, more stylized look. Now that we've looked at how general trends and themes have affected the designs of Generation 2 Pokémon, let's take a look at how new technology and mechanics influence these designs. Generation 2 introduced a number of gameplay features that would go on to become staples of the series. This includes two new types, Dark and Steel, that were added to help balance the battle system. The introduction of these two new types means that new Pokémon had to be designed to fill these types. Some Pokémon were changed from their original typing to fit this role, such as Umbreon, which was originally designed to be a poison type. Other Pokémon seem like they were designed specifically to fill out these new types, such as Skarmory, which looks like it was deliberately designed from the ground up to be a Steel type. Another new mechanic added in Generation 2 was Gender. However, male and female Nidoran are still treated as different species for some reason. However, with the addition of Pokémon Gender came Pokémon Breeding, and many older Pokémon were given new baby forms to show off this new mechanic. These baby Pokémon can only be obtained by breeding their older, more evolved forms, and basically look like cuter, more simplified versions of the original Pokémon. When it comes to specific repetitive design traits, Generation 2 is much less defined by this than Generation 1 was. For example, while it still does have some of the same eye styles that were used in Generation 1, they're used much less frequently. Angry anime eyes, for example, are mostly reserved for Pokémon like Houndoom, Tyranitar, and Ursaring that are designed to be particularly aggressive and threatening. In general, Generation 2 has a much wider variety of eye styles and is much more open to experimental styles such as Chinchu, Zatu, and Dunsparce. However, if I had to choose a style that seemed the most common, it would be a dark circle or oval with a small sparkle of light in it. This type of eye was used a few times in Generation 1, most notably for Pikachu, and is used several times in Generation 2. Other Gen 1 features, such as the three-clawed hands and feet, are also much less likely to be seen in Generation 2. 
Gen 2 has more of a trend towards nub-like arms with little or no definition. Technical limitations have also had an effect on these Pokemon designs. While Red and Green came out for the original Game Boy, Pokemon Gold and Silver came out on the Game Boy Color. While this didn't really change design limitations in terms of sprite size or complexity, it did give the designers much more freedom in terms of color. Pokemon in Generation 1 tended to have very simple color schemes with one main color and a lighter or darker accent color to provide additional detail. Gen 2 Pokemon, in contrast, tend to have a color scheme that consists of three or four main colors. This is largely due to the graphical abilities of the Game Boy Color. However, while it is able to show color, its graphical abilities are still pretty limited. Each sprite was limited to a single palette of four colors, and one of those colors was required to be transparent. In order to get around this, Pokemon battles are always shown on a white background, so this transparent color can be used as white. This limited the sprites to only having a few main colors, but it still allowed the designer to use color in a way they never could before. One way that the gold and silver designers expressed this newfound freedom was by designing Pokemon with vibrant complementary colors or by simply designing more colorful Pokemon overall. Good examples of this include Ariados, Togepi, Zatu, and of course, Ho-Oh. Speaking of Ho-Oh, that brings us to our next section, the design of legendary Pokemon. From developer interviews and design documents, it's pretty clear that the concept of legendary Pokemon, or something similar to them, had been around since the very early stages of Pokemon development. However, even after Red and Green's release, I don't think the concept of legendary Pokemon had really been fully fleshed out yet. When it came to these early games, Legendary Pokemon basically just boiled down to being very powerful and hard to catch. In Gold and Silver, however, the concept of Legendary Pokemon evolves somewhat. First, we actually get to hear legends about these Pokemon, specifically the story of Ho-Oh and the Burned Tower. For those who aren't familiar, this tells the story of three Pokemon who died when lightning struck what is now called the Burned Tower. Ho-Oh, who used to roost in the tower, revived these three Pokemon, which were widely believed to have been the original Eeveelutions, and they became the legendary beast trio Entei, Raikou, and Suicune. I believe that giving these legendary Pokemon this backstory helps add a sense of power and mystique, but their designs also reflect this, especially when compared to the legendary Pokemon in Generation 1. While I think that Mewtwo's design does a good job of conveying its role as a powerful mutant alien that's not to be messed with, I think that the legendary birds look relatively ordinary. Sort of like what you'd get if you evolved Pidgey with elemental stones. Compared to that, the legendaries in gold and silver I think do a good job of conveying their legendariness, because they don't look like anything else in the generation. No other Pokemon up to this point has the same level of detail and complexity in their designs as the legendary beasts, and this sets a real trend for the designs of legendary Pokemon going forward. Finally, I think a good way to really see how the designs have changed from the previous generation is to do a side-by-side -side comparison of Pokemon that serve similar roles in these games. The Pokemon series has a habit of repeating similar types of Pokemon that fill the same niche in the games, and I believe that by comparing these similar Pokemon, you can get a good apples-to-apples -apples comparison of their designs. <laughs> So much for watching. If you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss future parts in this series. If you haven't seen part one, you should definitely check it out, and if you want to see more you should check out my other videos, such as my previous one where I look at fractal game design in Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. I also have over a hundred articles in the Remton Games blog, which you can check out at the link in the description down below. 
and join me next time for the first video entry in my Game Designer Spotlight series, where I'm going to be taking a look at Game Designer Sid Meier. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.